So today we are finishing up our core Christmas series called Welcome to the Neighborhood, or Christmas in the Neighborhood, I should say. It's called Christmas in the Neighborhood. And all during this series, our theme has kind of been that we are all missionaries on mission assigned to a mission field. And that your neighborhood is literally your neighborhood, but our neighborhood are the people that we do life with. It's our, our coworkers. It's uh, the people on the ball field. It's uh, your classmates. It's just the different people. It's the, the people you see at the store all the time. Laura calls them her pharmacy friends. Like when she goes to the pharmacy, she's talking to the same people every week. In fact, one of the ladies she talked to this week that she's gotten to know just lost her mom. And so during this series, we're talking about what are we going to do when people are in difficult situations? We want to be the people of Jesus. We want to be there for people with the hope and the healing and the peace and the purpose of Jesus. So today, uh, since we are kind of, this is kind of like a Christmas uh, message. It has been throughout the entire series, but we're just a couple days away from Christmas. So um, I want to preach directly out of the Christmas story, Luke chapter 2. So if you have a Bible, uh, grab one. I normally read out of the New Living Translation, but today I'm going old school. I'm reading out of the King James Bible, and the reason I'm doing that is because today I'm reading out of my grandma's Bible. This is, uh, this is one of my prized possessions in life. My grandma, uh, every year when I was a little boy, we would gather at her house on Christmas Eve, and I would sit on my grandpa's lap, and he would read the Christmas story. And he always read it out of uh, this Bible, out of the King James Version, the old school. So that's what I want to read it out of today. I want to encourage you to, maybe on Christmas morning, you don't read the Christmas story. I, I would encourage you to make that a tradition in your family. I mean, I'm, I have been, I've heard the Christmas story every Christmas for, this will be my 54th year to hear the Christmas story read on Christmas morning. I just want to encourage you to do the same with, with your family. It doesn't matter what version you use. Use the one you're comfortable with. Uh, I, I sometimes will read it out of my grandma's Bible, and sometimes I just read it out of my own, my, my Bible, which is the New Living Translation. So if you have a Bible, Luke chapter 2, this is where the Christmas story is found. So if you're new to the Scriptures, the story of Jesus' birth is, is written down here, the account by this guy named Luke. Now, Luke was not a disciple of Jesus, but he was a follower of Jesus, and he talked to all the disciples and he talked to people who had these firsthand accounts and interactions with Jesus. And so then he wrote down this story about his birth. And it says this in chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Uh, oh, joy. Tax season. Even back in the day, Jesus had to pay taxes. So it says this. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. Got to be careful when I'm saying that because I know if I said, hey, Cyrenus or hey, Syria, Syria, right now your phones are going off wherever you are. Because <laughs> trust me, this morning when I was prepping this and I said that it, my, my phone went off when I, when I read that. So, and it says, all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. So Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth and Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So I just envision they're on the road to Bethlehem and, and Joseph's like, hurry, come on, because we got to have this baby before year's end because, you know, then we can claim it and it'll help us with our taxes. I, I don't know if that's the conversation they had, but how many people when that, I know that Logan and Emily probably had that conversation. This is going to be a good tax write-off for 2020. So it says this, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Today, the title of my message is On the Inside, Looking Out. On the Inside, Looking Out. And today, I want us to look at this story from a perspective that you may have never looked at it from before, and that is from the perspective of the innkeeper. Let's pray. God, in the moments that we have together during this Christmas season, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for the birth of your son. Thank you for that, that, uh, that the good news has come, and that is available for all of us who are watching, wherever it is that we're watching. Would you speak to us today in Jesus' name, and wherever you are watching today, would you say amen? 
during the Christmas season, a lot of people are, are traveling. I've been hearing from a lot of different people that have been traveling out of state. And whenever you travel, uh, you usually have to find a hotel or a motel to stay in. And, and that can be a mixed bag because you never know what you're going to get based on what you see. You know, like you go online, you look at the hotel, you look at the pictures, and then have you ever noticed that they, they, they quite, never quite measure up to the pictures? You're like, wait a second here, the pictures look like Ikea, but where we're staying looks a little bit more like grandma's house. I mean, I, I've had that many times. In fact, Laura and I just recently had probably the worst hotel experience we have ever had. If you've had a bad one, listen to this. So we were in Orlando, Florida, pre-pandemic, early this year, and we were at a conference, and we decided to stay around the airport, and so we found a hotel, just kind of a mid-level, and looked, looked nice. I looked at the pictures, it looked really nice, and, and we showed up, and the lobby looked decent, and we got our room key, and we started towards our room, and when we got into the hallway to go to our room, I, I, I was like, dude... I don't remember them saying they have an indoor pool because I had that, that smell. And I was like, there's no indoor pool here. What is that smell? We get to the room, open the door to the room, and woof, this overwhelming smell of ammonia just hits us harder than you can imagine. So, so intoxicating, we could hardly breathe. I'm like, did they just get finished cleaning up the crime scene? I, what? What's going on here? I was like, we can't sleep in this room. This is awful. So we went back to the front desk. We said, hey, let me explain the situation. They apologized, and they gave us another room. And so we went to the next room, and we get into the next hallway, and I'm like, smells again like the indoor pool. We get to the room, open up the door, and yes, whoosh, the overwhelming smell of ammonia. We're like, oh, we're so tired. So we go into the room, and and it's just so overwhelming. I'm like, man, Wow, okay, I don't need my allergy medicine tonight. So much for that deviated septum. Not a problem now. It was so overwhelming. I was like, we can't stay here, Laura. The, I, I'm not going to be able to sleep. So we go back to the front desk. Third time. Get another room. They put us in, an, in another uh, part of the hotel. We go to that room. Open up the door and whoosh. Yeah, the overwhelming smell of ammonia again. But it, by this time, it's 1130 at night. I'm like, I'm so exhausted. Let's just go in. Let's just make the best of it. And so we go in and we just kind of start to crash. Laura's washing off her face in the sink and she looks down and she's like, ah, there's hair in the sink and it's not hers. You, I don't know what it is about someone else's hair, but you know when you see someone else's hair in the sink, it's just so disturbing. And it's like, honey, I'm so tired. We just need to stay. And I'd kicked my shoes off and I was walking around. I sat down and I, uh, you know, as so when I was walking as is like this. And I was like, that's weird. And I put my, my foot up, looked at bottom of my sock. It looked like I had motor oil on the bottom of my sock. I, this is the worst experience ever. I'm like, let's just go to bed. I'm so exhausted. We pull back the sheets and there on the bed, only a little bit, but there were a couple of spots of blood. Ah, I was like, yes, they did just clean up the crime scene. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so, so we just put on our hazmat suits, and we just went to bed. It was just, it was the worst stay ever. I, listen, I don't care how bad your hotel stay has been. None of us have had it as bad as Jesus. Like the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world did not stay at a five-star hotel. He slept in a barn. Like The only other person I know that slept in a barn was Laura's grandma during the Great Depression. She was a little girl, and her mom had, had died, and her dad was not able to find a job, and he took her and her little sister, and they slept in a barn. That's where they lived. And when you hear that, you think, that, that is disturbing. That is so cruel. You can't put kids in a barn. But that is the scene here. When we think about the birth of Jesus, we always think of it as this glorious moment, which it obviously was, but we glorify the barn. It was a barn. Go, go back to the story. Now, this is out of the New Living Translation. Luke chapter 2. 
verse 7. She gave birth, that's Mary, to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger. Oh, we just think, ah, oh, it's so beautiful. No, 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 this is not a bassinet, okay? This is a feeding trough. This is the, what the animals eat out of. That's where Jesus was. And say this with me, because there was no lodging available for them. I like what the old school translation says. My grandma's Bible says, because there was no room for them in the inn. We're talking about the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, and, and the innkeeper says, I got nothing for you. Are, are you kidding me? Now, now, in his defense, he doesn't know the situation and what's happening and what's going on here, but we're talking about a young pregnant woman, okay? She's about to give birth. Like, where's the compassion, my friend? And he says, I, I don't have a room which wasn't true. It wasn't true. There was room. His room. He could have given up his room. Now, I don't know why he didn't give up his room. Maybe he had a Tempur-Pedic. Maybe he had a sleep number bed. I don't know. But for some reason, he's like, you're not, you're not taking my room. And this was, listen, this was his moment, and he missed it. He missed it. Like, turn to somebody wherever you are and tell them, don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment. I, I think Core Church is a lot like the inn in this story. It's, it's a place where people can find shelter. It's a place where they can find rest. We talk about it all the time. They can find hope for their heart, healing for their soul, peace of mind, purpose in the world. And, and you and I are like the innkeepers. We are given opportunities by God to love and serve our neighbors. I'd like for you to write this down. The church is not an end for insiders. The church is not an end for insiders. The church is an end for outsiders. The church is not an end for insiders. The church is an end for outsiders. And the innkeeper, he missed his moment. Instead of being the main character, he instead becomes just this footnote in history. Like, we don't know his name. Uh, I said last week, Laura and I have been to Israel. There's no statue to this guy. There's no memorial. There's no museum to the innkeeper. I mean, there's, there's, there's none of that. So I wonder, what will history say about our church? What will history say about core church? Will it say that we loved and served our neighbors, or will we just be a footnote? See, 2020, I think, has presented one of the greatest opportunities for the church. No greater opportunity has the church had almost in human history than what has been happening right now. And honestly, it would be really easy for all of us to be a little bit like this innkeeper here and go, you know what, I got no room. I mean, come on, let's just be honest. 2020, I, I don't have no room. I'm so busy. I'm overwhelmed enough with my own problems, my own struggles. I don't hardly have, to, I don't have time for any, it's not that I don't care. I just, I just don't have any room. I don't have any margin to help. But well, you know what I love about the people of Core Church? Core Church is not a footnote kind of church. We have a church that is stepping up and taking their place. In fact, next week is Celebration Sunday. Uh, we're going to be all online next Sunday, by the way. So if you're thinking about coming in person next Sunday, don't, because it's all going to be all online. And you are going to hear some insanely amazing stories of what people have been doing, the people of Core Church, and how they've been serving in the middle of what has been happening in 2020. The stories are, I watched some of the video, and it just overwhelmed me to watch what people are doing, how they're serving their neighbors, how they're giving overwhelm, uh, giving exponentially gener generously to the people around them. Uh, we starting a church in Ethiopia, feeding starving people in Guatemala, feeding 65,000 people here in the Tulsa area. I mean, our people are making a difference. Don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment moment. God wants to do something through you. He wants to use you. You can take your place in history. You do not have to be just a 
footnote. Come on, turn to somebody wherever you are and tell them I'm not going to be a footnote. I am not going to be a footnote. Let's take our place. Because the innkeeper here, he just missed his moment. And, but, there, but there's another story that Jesus tells. Now, this one is 30 years later. So Jesus is now in his early 30s, and he tells another story uh, about a different innkeeper and a completely different response. And I just wonder, I don't know that this is true, but I just wonder if Jesus, when he tells this story, is not reflecting back on the innkeeper that rejected him. And now he's telling a different story about kind of how the innkeeper should be and the kind of person he should be. This one's found in Luke chapter 10. You can look up Luke chapter 10. I'll just paraphrase the story for you. And many of you, if you've been in church, you may know this story. But if you're new to church, let me introduce you to the story of the Good Samaritan. So in this story, a religious leader comes to Jesus and says, hey, what do I got to do to get to heaven? And so they have this conversation, and Jesus uh, says to him, well, what does the law of Moses say? In other words, what does the, as we know, the Old Testament, what does the Old Testament say? And the guy says, well, it says that I should love God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind, and I, I should love my neighbor as myself, which is, by the way, where we get our four core values of hope, healing, peace, and purpose. And Jesus looks at him, and he says, yeah, you're right, absolutely correct. And then the guy says this, he says, so who's my neighbor? And then Jesus tells him this story, this story of the Good Samaritan. If you know the story, uh, you're familiar with the priest and the Levite and their reaction. If you're new to church, there's this man, and he's, he's a Jewish man. He's been robbed. He's been left for dead on the side of the road, and a priest comes by, okay, a pastor like me. I <laughs> comes by, sees the guy, crosses on the other side of the road, and doesn't help the guy. Then a Levite, the Levite is like a temple assistant, like a, a volunteer in the church. If you're on a core team, that'd be like you. Passes by, goes over, looks at the guy, but then goes back to the other side of the road and is like, yeah, I got, I got to get to the temple because I'm needing in the kids' ministry, so I don't really have, have time. And so he doesn't help. And then the Samaritan comes by. The Samaritan, completely different reaction. He sees this Jewish man. He goes over. And it says that he had compassion on him and that he, he wrapped his wounds with bandages. And then we read this in verse 34 of chapter 10. Then the Samaritan put the man on his own donkey and say this with me, took him to an inn where he took care of him. Think about this. Unlike the innkeeper in Luke chapter two, where he said, I don't have no room. This innkeeper, he made room. Now, this is very, very unusual and not something that was normal in that culture. This is just a story that Jesus tells. It's not really a true story. It's, it's a parable as we know it. But when Jesus is telling this, he's really trying to make a point because the Jews and the Samaritans, they don't like each other. The Jews think of the Samaritans as less than dogs. And because the Samaritans have been so abused and so mistreated by the Jewish people, they can't stand the Jewish people. And so Jesus tells this story about a Samaritan who's helping a Jew. And they both show up at the inn. And they, they could have been rejected when they got to the inn. I mean, this is, get the, here's the picture. This is like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris showing up at the Trump Christmas party, okay? Hey, hey, what's up? Got a gift for you. It's an eviction notice. Yeah, I, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, come on now. Come on, we need to loosen up. See, now wait a second. Now, when I said, some of you are like, oh, that's just not right. That's not fair. That just, just gets under my skin a little bit. That's a little bit of what's happening here. I want us to get a picture, like, as much as it's, it's polarizing right now, the way the blue doesn't like the red and the Democrats and the Republicans, but the way it is in our country, it is uh, 10 times worse. Just imagine the worst of circumstance. That's what's happening here. And here's the thing. We don't know if the innkeeper was Jewish or if he was a Samaritan. Let's think about this. If he was Jewish, he could have said, listen, I'll take in the guy who's been hurt, but you, the guy who brought him, you, Mr. Samaritan, you ain't coming, you ain't staying at my, my place. Now, imagine if he was a Samaritan. If the innkeeper had been a Samaritan, he could have easily said, hey, listen, no, no, you can come in because you're a fellow Samaritan, but this guy that's all bloody and beat up, uh, no, he ain't coming in. He can stay out in the barn if, if even, even that. He could have easily rejected them, but he didn't. He took both men in. 
This is a picture of the church. We are called as followers of Jesus to care for all people. Turn to somebody wherever you are and say, we are cared to call for everyone. We are cared, we are called to care for everyone. Doesn't matter who you voted for, doesn't matter the color of their skin, doesn't matter their sexual orientation, does not matter uh, what they think, what they believe. It, it doesn't matter who they were with last night, what they were doing last night. Uh, it doesn't matter your past. Listen, everyone is welcome to stay and be a part of this church because the church is not an inn for insiders. The church is an inn for outsiders. So in verse 29 of chapter 10, where the religious leader asked Jesus, he says, who is my neighbor? Now, when he asked that question, what he's really doing in that moment is he's simply trying to justify rejecting certain people. Because you may or may not know this, but the religious leaders in this time period, they were just kind of full of themselves, and they thought of themselves as holy and righteous and separated from and better than other people. And so they wouldn't associate with certain people groups. They wouldn't um, minister to certain people groups. Even the temple was closed off to certain people groups. Oh, oh, you're with those people. You can worship here. Oh, oh, you're Jewish? Oh, and you're, you, you come on in. This is what the religious leaders are doing. And Jesus kind of comes into this scene and he says, oh, you want to know who your neighbor is? I know what you're thinking. I know you're trying to give yourself permission to reject certain people, but your neighbor, my friend, is a person who did not vote the same as you. Your neighbor is the one who doesn't have the same sexual identity as you. Your neighbor is the person who doesn't think like you, dress like you, look like you, or act like you. This is what Jesus tells us. I think the church is kind of like a Holiday Inn. You know, you know, if you've ever stayed at a Holiday Inn, that is like one of the most diverse hotels in, on, on the planet. There are all kinds of people up at the Holiday Inn. Like When you go down for the breakfast buffet, I mean, you see... <laughs> You see all kinds of crazy at the breakfast buffet. You're like, oh my goodness, this is why we locked our doors last night, kids. <laughs> it's, just, it's a bunch of crazy people. But I think this is a picture of the church. This is who the church is. We are a, a radically, radically crazy bunch of people who come together from all different walks, all different places to come together under the same roof. And we are all just a little bit crazy, like turn to somebody and tell them, yeah, you're part of the crazy. You are part of the crazy. This is the church, all kinds of different people. And if we're going to be a, a church for outsiders, here's the thing, we gotta get outside of ourselves. We got to be different than the world is right now, because this is one thing the world refuses to do. I'm going to separate myself. It's not just a religious leader problem from Jesus' day. Everybody's doing this now. I'm just going to go with my people group. People think like me, talk like me, act like me, and I'm just going to separate from people who aren't like me. That's very, very dangerous. In fact, social media and the internet is kind of perpetuating this problem. Uh, if, if you've seen the social dilemma, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, they had these algorithms. If you're not aware of this, you've got to be aware of this. When you're on social media and you like something, they notice that, and they show you more of what you like. When you, when you scan by something, you don't open something, they notice that, and they kind of push that to the side. Don't, don't show them that as much. You ever notice when you're on social media that, wow, there's not really anybody that I disagree with. You're like, I hear about this all the time, that people are on social media saying mean things, doing mean things, or, or acting certain ways, but I don't see it, and it's because social media is pushing you to people who look like you, think like you, act like you, and talk like you. Internet does the same thing. When you Google something, guess what? It knows what you like to buy. It knows what you think. It knows how you vote. It, it, it just recognizes, and it will push you to that thing. Just try tomorrow at work. Just go to work tomorrow. Go on your campus tomorrow. Pick a word, okay? Republican, Democrat, you know, Black Lives Matter. Pick, pick anything, something in, the, in our culture that's happening right now. Google it. Watch what comes up on your Google search. Watch what comes up on everyone else's Google search. We as a church have got to fight against this because here's what's happening. As a result, there's been a dehumanization in our culture. We no longer treat people like they're human. The things we say about one another is like no other time. 
I mean, we, the, we say the cruelest and meanest things about fellow humans. And here's the reason we do that. It's because whenever you keep somebody at an arm's length, they are no longer human. They're just kind of an object. Great example of that is sports. Like think about watching the Big 12 championship yesterday and, and, and how people were yelling and screaming obscenities and, and putting things on Twitter about players and people that you're like, oh my goodness, I, wow, I can't believe they would. That's, they're saying the cruelest and meanest things about boys. Like these aren't even men yet. They're kids going to college, trying to get an education, trying to further their life, and all we want to do is beat them down. Why do we do that? I've been guilty of that. It's because we keep them at arm's length. You know the people that don't do that? Mom and dad. Every time they'll show a mom and dad in the stands, <laughs> doesn't matter what that player did, mom and dad are trying to support them. At least most of the time. I mean, come on. Some moms, sometimes mom and dad, you're like, oh, you get, I, I get that. But the truth is, we got to draw people in. They need to learn their story. This is why we can't be a church on the inside and, and just looking out. We've got to go to the outside and bring the outsiders in because we got to get close because once you know people's story, suddenly now you begin to care about them. That is who Jesus was. Jesus listened to people's stories. He ate with the sinners. He forgave the prostitutes. He, he called the rejected. And this is what makes the church so beautiful and why it is like no other place on the planet. This is who we are. Years and years ago, Laura and I, when we were first married and we had just a couple of kids, uh, we took a trip for Christmas to the West Coast and we got stuck in a blizzard. Uh, and we were coming through New Mexico, and it was just, it was not drivable. And I was trying to make it, but the next thing I know, that the, the National Guard was out on the interstate. They, they closed the interstate. They were forcing everyone off the interstate. No one was allowed on the interstate. And so they forced us into this really small town in New Mexico. And you want to talk about no room at the inn. They only had like three hotels, and they were gone. There wasn't any room. And so then they were putting people at the National Guard, and it was packed full. We ended up that night at a high school gymnasium with two kids at the time, Stephen and Shane, and, and we had a couple of blankets that we'd brought with us in the car, and that was it. And we slept on a gym floor. So the, the, the church, the church is an inn. It, it's a place where people can find shelter from the storms of life. And right now, I mean, in 2020, people are tired. They're discouraged. They're worn down. They're frustrated. They're, they're, they're confused, and they don't know what to do, and they're wondering where to go and who can I turn to. I want to ask you this. When your neighbors are seeking shelter, which innkeeper will you be? Man, let's not be an in for insiders. Let's be an in for outsiders.